So welcome everyone to today's first continuity community. Uh, the topic today is on teaching labs. My name is Beth Luoma and I am Assistant Director of Faculty Teaching Initiatives at the Porvoo Center for Teaching and Learning. We're hoping that by the end of today's session, you'll have the opportunity to first and foremost, hear how other Yale instructors are developing and implement, implementing plans to transition their lab courses online. But second, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and to consider how the strategies that you're hearing may be applied to your own courses. And third, uh, this is named Continuity Community for a reason. We're really hoping to form a community here. We're realizing we're in a time of isolation, that we're physically separated, but at the same time, we still belong to the same scholarly community of educators. So we hope that you'll bring that community attitude today as we, we share information out as colleagues. And lastly, to know how to follow up for additional support. So at the end, I'll provide a number of resources as well as ways to engage with the Porvoo Center if you feel you need extra help right now. So as I said before, my name is Beth Luoma. I'm Assistant Director of Faculty Teaching Initiatives at the Porvoo Center for Teaching and Learning. And it's our great honor to have our featured guest here today, Kate Schilling. She is Associate Research Scientist in Chemical and Environmental Engineering. And she's also Associate Conser Conservation Research Scientist in the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. So at this time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give Kate the opportunity to present. Um, SESS has taken a really fantastic coordinated approach to thinking about their teaching team and how to teach labs. So we'd like you to, give, to have the opportunity to hear from Kate. Um, after that, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers, both in the chat and in our verbal discussion. And we'll see what uh, what's on people's minds, what else they'd like to talk about before sharing out some resources and giving you the opportunity to provide feedback. Uh, before I proceed, any questions from the room about what we're trying to accomplish or suggestions of other things we should be doing? Okay, I'm going to unshare my screen and give Kate the opportunity to share. Alrighty, sorry, give me a minute. Rearrange my screen. This is my first Zoom PowerPoint presentation, so thanks so much. But uh, I'd really like to start by thanking Beth and the Porvoo Center because they've been an amazing resource to us at this time. Um, I, they've got to be really stressed out, but I get nothing but peace and lots of information from them. So thank you all so much for everything you're doing to keep us going. Um, and I'm here uh, with you guys today sharing on behalf of a really incredible team of a lot of people who I've named um, on the title slide, but I'd also like to thank Mike and Andy for keeping us going in person in the facility because um, it, it really, really takes a village to keep these things going. Um, I'm going to start by preaching to the choir. Uh, labs are a really critical part of the undergraduate science and engineering experience. Um, it's a chance for students to interact firsthand with what they've been learning in lecture, to learn where data, or how you gather data, uh, where, where theory comes from, and, and how to uh, be a resilient problem solver with technical expertise. Um, Hands-on education in the lab is life-changing. It was for me, it is for a lot of students. Um, and it, it makes you uh, a stronger researcher it's for experimentalists, but theoreticians benefit too. Um, and it makes you, you ready for the workforce. And especially with seniors, this is a concern we share with faculty um, about how do we make sure that these students are really, really ready? Um, and what can we do to keep this spirit going? So um, I work uh, out of the Greenberg Engineering Teaching Concourse in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Um, and I, I interface with the chemical and environmental en engineering faculty. Um, and when we sat down on, it, it might be just last Tuesday, I'm not sure, it feels like a long time ago, but we had counted up how many courses we have going on and we have at least 16 lab courses. That's not counting capstone projects. And it's spanning biomedical, chemical and environmental engineering, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. So we're trying to think about how to translate the take home, the take home benefits, metaphorical take home benefits of working with robots, working with reactors, making, you know, um, making radios. How do you, how do you take those ideas that, that students are getting in lab and how do you actually physically get them to take them home with them? Um, so this was, this was a, a big challenge, uh, but fortunately we've got a great team and so we, we took it in stride and we thought about, okay, well, what, 
what matters? So we worked with faculty, we identified all the faculty and we, we talked with them to find out how can we actually retool this, this curriculum. So we identified the major, major learning objectives for the lab experiments and experiences. And then we thought about how can we, what are, what are the tools that we have available? Um, potentially, I did see a comment about how to deal with students who don't have internet access and that is a really open and burning question for me um, and the rest of the team. Um, and it's one that Yale College is working to address, I understand. Um, but these are the main, the, the three main uh, routes that we took. So we thought about remote, remote desktop, setting that up so that students have access to software um, that they normally would use in, on campus uh, for modeling exercises. Um, video demos and working with existing data um, and actually mailing kits to students. So uh, Kevin Ryan, from the Greenberg Center is underneath a giant pile of kits that he's preparing for electrical engineering students and more on that later. Um, but first, the major uh, software packages we were looking at were Onshape, which is a nice alternative to SolidWorks that it's more accessible for students at home. Multisim um, is a tool that we're using for electrical engineering and ProSim Plus is something for chemical engineering looking at processes. Um, but what we did, because we do have these computer labs, we set up remote accessing for students um, by their courses. So we had designated computers for each of these classes that might need this software. Um, this is, I think, the, the coolest thing that we did, um, speaking as an, as, as an experimentalist, um, was creating this mobile, mobile recording studio. Um, and this actually uh, was an exercise that, that Glenn Murphy, uh, Weston Murphy aced. Um, in designing something, finding the best sources that are still accessible. Because when we were going shopping on Tuesday last week, I think it was last week, so many things were sold out. Um, it's amazing how many people are, are trying to do things like this um, and take everything on. I mean, we all are. So finding good options. And then once it shows up, um, many thanks to the, the shipping industry. Um, but yeah, once it showed up, putting together a, a really nice product that, that was highly usable. So shout out to Sandra Gomez and Kevin Gleason. This is uh, a shot from them working yesterday um, with the wind tunnel to record um, experiments for uh, Mechanical Engineering 363. Um, and so this, this is a cart that we actually have. We have uh, two setups. One of them is stationary, one of them is mobile uh, down in Greenberg for doing video recording of, of experiments. So uh, I, I used this uh, with Zhong King uh, to record the remaining ex four experiments for uh, Chemical Engineering 412. Um, we didn't, in some cases, we didn't run the whole experiment, like with the membrane separation of, of oxygen. Uh, that's not the most riveting thing to watch. Um, and the students can look at the data and, and analyze it. But the important thing for us was to show them where this existing data came from. So the details of the apparatus, how you use it, what are the sources of error. Um, something that I found really important that I, when I was thinking about what do you learn in lab, some of that's safety. Safety is not the, the funnest thing to relay, but I, I did run down in the distillation demonstration, the distillation of ethanol, um, the, uh, the safety concerns, because process safety is a really important part of their education. So, um, and it's, it's a really important thing that we would talk to them about in person. So we tried to capture as much of the door-to-door -door lab experience as possible. And all of our labs start with the safety lecture and the, the TFs go through the the details of the apparatus and talk about how they're going to go about acquiring their data. So we, we didn't want them to just get a spreadsheet or a MATLAB file and then just, you know, okay, I guess I'm going to do this exercise like my homework. We wanted to ground it in, in, in the actual experiment itself. So it's, it's not as good as actually doing it yourself, but they can at least see, see where things came from. And uh, so we, we ended up doing this um, with a lot of the experiments uh, for the course. Um, and we did have the option because, you know, Chemical Engineering 412 is, is, is not a new course. So students, um, well, Paul Van Tassel, the instructor, he's had, you know, he has access to many terms of data, but we decided that it would actually be, uh, create a good community feeling for the students um, to actually share their data from earlier in the term um, so that they could at least, if something came up, they knew which students they could talk to 
about like, hey, you know, I I see that, you know, some things that, you know, I don't, there's this problem or I'm curious about what happened on this day. So they, they at least get the metadata, the, you know, the things that the student wouldn't necessarily put in their report, um, but they, they get access to that. Um, and the students can then act as subject matter experts. Um, and they can feel like they're doing something because I don't know, for me at least, the stress of this whole situation going on globally, it, it feels good to do something. So letting the students kind of pitch in and be there for each other um, is to me a good thing. Um, so uh, the picture in the bottom, the bottom left of the square, uh, that represents the partial height of the kits that, uh, we're, that Kevin is preparing for his electric, electrical engineering students. So this is the most, uh, to me, overwhelming, but also beneficial thing to do. Um, the students are actually going to get to work on the projects that they were going to work on in the first place, just at home. Um, and so this is the, the EE department. They're really striving to have the same experience happen. So Kemi, we're moving towards this idea of, of video demos and, and um, working on existing data, but the EE people are, are really soldiering on and, and making things happen in the home. So that's a uh, follow up with Kevin if you're interested in uh, learning about this, the details of the kits, but they're really working on, on trying to keep the students' hand skills and um, experience the same. Um, there's also, I'm not the subject matter expert on this, but there's some really interesting developments with the self-driving uh, uh, car that one of the courses was working on. Um, and so I think Glenn is, on, Glenn is on the call, so hopefully he has some details on that. But they are actually working, the car is constructed, they're working together on the code to um, make it run. So they're doing that actually via Zoom, I think. But there's a, it's, it's, pretty fun. Vince has shared a photo last night that I should have uploaded into this of the course. Um, but the other group that I haven't talked about yet, but that is crucial, um, are the people at the Center for Engineering Innovation and Design. So Joe, uh, Joe Zinter, Larry Wylan, Ashlyn Oaks, Antonio Medina, they are amazing people because they're really digging in and learning how to use all of the nooks and crannies and special features of Zoom. Um, so they're aggregating resources, but they're also generating resources. And so they've been making some really helpful instructional videos on like the ZEID intro to Zoom engineering innovation and design. They actually piloted uh, a, a, their own little lecture uh, showing the power of a whiteboard with a webcam. Because one of the most frequent questions that we get from faculty is, I use both PowerPoint and a whiteboard to lecture. So how can I do that uh, from my house? So um, they've been really doing a lot of, of clever, uh, clever solutions like they always do. But yeah, it's, it's, they're really turning this, treating this like an engineering design problem and coming up with really good, good results and communicating it very well. So they're, they're really wonderful partners. Um, but to close, I just want to thank the Porvoo Center again, and Beth, uh, thanks so much for, for letting me share on, on behalf of the team. Um, and we have an extensive and wonderful team, but I, I love this picture from Handsome Dan's Instagram. It's not an unusual thing for me to say, but um, I just, I feel like him right now on the other side of the TV, cheering on my teammates and um, hoping that, you know, things, things turn out all right in the end. But thank you so much, and I'd, I'd really love uh, to hear your, your questions, comments, and uh, share ideas with you guys. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. So what's great is that the, the points and resources I've already collected, um, many of them have already been shared out, but a major takeaway that um, I tried to reiterate from what Kate described as, as their department's experience is as you're considering transitioning online and you're, and you're finding yourself in a fork in the road and, and trying to make a decision on the best call, to just come back to your learning goals. Obviously, we can't replicate the in-person, hands-on lab experience when we're in front of our computers. But when you think about your learning goals, what knowledge do you hope that students will attain? What skills do you hope that they'll learn? What viewpoints do you hope they'll develop? And in what ways can you come as close as possible to replicating that as you're working in this online environment? Um, 
a few alternative approaches, some of which have already come up in conversation. Um, perhaps there's a seminal paper that accomplishes the same lab experimental technique that you were going to do. Is that an opportunity to engage with the classic literature, have them think about how the experiment was done, limitations, approaches, all of that? Could that be an alternative? People have already mentioned providing sample experimental data, so the students can't necessarily generate the data themselves, but can you give them a data set that they can work with and still proceed through that analysis? Um, other instructors have offered the idea of writing out the process of the lab and considering, you know, the Kate mentioned safety uh, ideas, thinking about where error gets introduced, um, just really trying to write out the process as you think about what it means to complete the lab. And then we have a number of virtual lab resources. Uh, Joe had mentioned JOBE, that's actually the first link on my list, and FET, iBiology, I um, Chem Collective Virtual Labs. Uh, we have a whole list of those. If you have others, please feel free to share them in the chat window. Um, also submit them on the sharing a feedback form and we'll collate those resources and continue to expand out that labs and studios page on our academic continuity website. But last but not least, thank you for being here and for contributing this conversation. Um, I was very happy to see a number of positive comments in the chat window, some private to me, some shared out about the value of hearing each other's perspectives. So we hope that you continue to leverage each other as colleagues as, as you think about creative solutions and how to move forward. There is a link that I'm about to share out in the chat window um, to our feedback form. And so uh, we asked, or actually one of my co-workers on our staff members, don't mind just copying and pasting that, that would be great. Um, but if you could click that link and use the last few minutes of the hour to fill the form out, it's a quick uh, five question form. Uh, fill out whatever you'd like among those questions. They'll really help us. As I mentioned, this was our first continuity community. We're hoping we can offer more and offer uh, communities that are on topics that you care about and that you really need to know about now. So if you have ideas for what those topics might be, please include that in the form. I will follow up with an email to all of you uh, with additional resources, including these slides and the recording once it becomes available. And last, if you need additional teaching support, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we have our website, academiccontinuity.yale.edu. It is constantly growing and expanding. And we also have our email to get in touch with both pedagogical experts as well as people who support our educational technology. And lastly, I've included my contact information. So if there's anything specifically you'd like to send to me, there's my email address. But with that, I would just like to thank you all for being here and contributing your expertise and um, best of luck as, as we move forward during this kind of challenging time. Thanks.